All right, so let me set this video up for you real quick. You're not gonna see my face in this. Welcome to SoFlow TV. You're gonna hear an ex-FBI agent talk about Jamaican gang members, undercover, snitching, Jamaican gang life, political connections, Jamaica prime minister, seen with his own two eyes in pictures and videos they have of well as proof of the prime minister in a room with a table full of cocaine and guns with gangsters and all these things all right listen carefully to the video and then leave your comments in the comment section below i know this ain't nothing new but i'm just saying for us to hear it from outside sources at this level tells a lot corruption is rampant and we already know that watch and listen closely all right see you Informant handling more than development. Well, it sounds like it was a great uh, training opportunity. I mean, it really was. Um, so, how long did you do that? For about two years, and then the New York office was starting a new squad back in Manhattan. Um, and I kind of, uh, I was kind of seeing the writing on the wall that if I was going to get a more vast experience, I was going to have to move, or else I was going to have to stay on this squad for. 15 or 20 years before I was going to be in a position to kind of kind of get my own thing going. They started what was called a non-traditional organized crime squad, which at that time in New York meant going after one half the squad was going after Jamaicans and the other was going after the Chinese gangs. And so I volunteered for that squad and my supervisor endorsed me and I moved back into the main office in Manhattan and got on the ground floor of this brand new squad that was taken off and it had a great supervisor and a great primary relief uh, and that's where I really started learning how to develop informants and uh, and uh, you know I, it just took off now was assigned to the Jamaican squad at uh, the Jamaican side of the squad and I just got really fortunate one day early on we had a walk-in um, a guy walk into the office saying he had a bunch of information on this big Jamaican gang that was operating in Brooklyn. And, you know, I sat down and, and uh, I had a, a first grade NYPD detective as my partner, which was a very, another very fortunate thing. And uh, it was shortly into the interview, we stepped out and, you know, he kind of knew exactly what was going on and schooled me on it. And this guy was actually part of this gang and there was an internal war going on in the gang. And although he brought himself in as a concerned citizen living in the neighborhood that was just going to give us all, he was giving us such a detail of the inner workings of the gang that my he father knew he had to be a member. He had to be a member. And really what it was, as it turned out, him and his three brothers were kind of a breakaway faction of the gang, was trying to take over the gang. And he thought he was going to be smarter than us, right? He was a former Jamaican cop and, and down in Jamaica. And he thought he was just going to enlist our help in getting rid of the other side of the gang. Um, so we played his game for about a year, um, and we kind of ran him for about a year until the, 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 the war started getting really serious. And, um, you know, he called me one day and said, hey, uh, you're going to hear about, you know, they're trying to set me up. The other part of the gang is trying to set me up. They're going to say that I drove down the block and, and, and shot out of my car and hit a bunch of people, and a girl was hitting a little kid. Was it wasn't true. It's not true. And I said, okay, just, you know, meet us in the office. Come in the office, and we'll... Well, you know, by the time I talked to my detectives out in the field that worked the precinct, because after a year we knew these guys, the precinct-level detectives who knew everybody in the neighborhood, we knew our guy actually did the shooting. So we. So what happened when he came in? He never, he never left. We literally <laughs> interviewed him all night. We had the AUSA on the phone. We drew up a complaint and information, and we charged him. And he did not come in thinking he was going to be spending the next, you know, 20 years in jail. And we had to, you know, kind of get him to that point. And uh, so it was an all-night, one of these all-nighters, you know, three, four, five in the morning talking to him. And the AUSA, you know, very next day, first thing in the morning, he was appeared before a magistrate. He got the information signed, and we charged him, and then he cooperated. He had a brother already. One of his other three brothers was already in state jail. And then, and then we got his third brother in custody that same day, the next day, and then... He had one brother that we were, we spent a week trying to get to come in as well, and he said he would. We had a couple of meetings with him, a couple of phone meetings with him, and he said he just had to handle a few things. I think in the back of his mind, he knew he was going to jail too, like his other three brothers, and he wound up getting in a shootout and getting killed with the gang, with the other members of the gang. 
and he was okay. going to go out in the blaze of glory. He realized his three brothers were in jail. The rest of the gang was kind of winning this this internal war, and and that was actually my first like homicide where I was actually called out at night to a homicide scene. Here's the guy we've been looking for. We all shot up twenty times or something, and so there was my schooling in you know gang drug work homicide. You know I never thought I would be standing at a homicide live homicide. Uh, I talked to my dad later on. It just didn't seem to be like things FBI agents do, but it was a new age. All right, so this was a situation, and, and which doesn't happen very often, when your um, informant actually becomes your subject. Right. And, and, and quickly thereafter became my cooperating witness. It was kind of a uh, you know, process that didn't stop. He was an informant, became subject, became a cooperating witness. So all, it was very smooth, the transition. I mean, it was... It was one of, like I said, it was one of them all-night interviews, all-night type of things, convincing him. No, he was very not willing to do it, and, and it was one of those things where I really learned from my this first-grade detective I was working with how to talk to people, how to talk to this guy, how to convince him, and it was not easy. It was, it was you know, we were exhausted, he was exhausted, the, the mental exhaustion sets in, and you just you're in that interrogation room literally all night long. Sun's coming up the next day, and we're finally making some headway, and you know, and, and it was just it was one of those seminal moments of a career where you just, everything just kind of opens up, your eyes open up, and say, "This is what you want to do. This is what you were meant to do." What would you say was the difference between working, uh, the, you know, the Italian mob and this Jamaican mob? What was the difference, or was there a difference? Yeah, I think the difference was well, first of all, the violence. The Jamaicans would shoot at us over a five dollar bag of crack um the italians not so much right so they had we had an understanding with them i mean i remember being taken along to talk to the, the boss vicka musso the boss of of the lucchese family at the time uh i went with one of the older agents that we had credible threat against his life we didn't tell him we had overheard it on title three but that's how it <laughs> happened and right. you know, we, we approached him on a you know here's the boss of the family surrounded by his inner circle his bodyguards and they're all in their sweatsuits and they're hanging out at a handball court in, in Queens. And you walk up to him and say, you know, Mr. Russo, we have to inform you. We have this credible you know, threat against your life. He feigns this shock on, you know, and, and it was a very, it was one of those movie scenes, you know, well, I don't know why agents, thanks for telling me, but I have no idea why anybody would want to harm me. You know, yes, and, I'm just a businessman. Yeah, you know, and so we satisfied our legal, you know, obligation to let him know. And, and we walked away and, and, but we, you would never have that type of interaction on the, with the Jamaicans. Whenever we were in the street working them in Brooklyn, it was always much more high tension, much more looking over your shoulder. Even when you're on surveillance, you were, you know, always knowing that they could and probably would shoot at you because, the, you know, they were all born and raised in Jamaica. It was a much more violent society. Um, the, there was much less respect for the police. And the, it, it was much different. It, it, it was in that in that sense. Um, the other thing was, and you know, when I was working the Italians, they weren't most of many of them weren't cooperating, especially once you arrested them. They were willing to go to jail for ten or twenty years and do their time. Um, it was later when you know Sammy the Bull and, and a lot of guys started to flip that that changed. But that was after my time. I had already left and gone to work with the Jamaicans. Um, but the Jamaicans would um, because mainly. A, they were facing Title 21 drug charges, which carried much, much stiffer penalties. Um, and they were mainly in the crack trade, and the crack guidelines on the sentencing guidelines on crack were very, very tough. So most of them never faced those guidelines. Most of them cooperated. They got their 5K letter, and, and they got a break from them, which allowed the judge to depart down on the sentencing guidelines. And so the guidelines were really only a, a hammer over their head that 95% of them never faced. I think my, my first indictment on my, that the gang case that I was talking about, I think we indicted 54 people, and uh, we went to trial on six. We had 48 people plead out, or, you know, not all of them cooperated, um, but most of them did. That was the main difference. And the other difference was the, simply the level of violence that the Jamaicans were willing to, to engage in. The Italians knew that, that it wasn't good for business to... to be violent towards police, and uh, you know that was something they learned over decades and decades and, and generations. Um, the Jamaicans, uh, you know, most of my subjects were born and raised in Jamaica, a violent place where they didn't respect the police. There was a high level of corruption in the police down there. 
you know, so they brought that kind of uh, attitude with them to the streets of Brooklyn and, and, Bro and the Bronx. Those were the two main differences when I went over to the, the, the Jamaicans. The good, the good difference was we were able to get a lot more cooperators. The bad difference was that even on a surveillance, you always had to have your head on a swivel. They, you know, whenever you chased them, I mean, I, I don't think I ever arrested a guy, a Jamaican that did not have a gun on him. Um, you know, and, and some of them resisted and we rolled around. I remember rolling around on the streets, you know, with these guys and the gun would come out of his waistband and, and things. So, I mean, it was, you know, it was commonplace, that, that kind of, that kind of thing. Now, was there a particular head of the family? You know, was there a Don in the Jamaican? Yeah, gang? there was actually. Um, and all of the gangs in Jamaica, in the Jamaican gangs in New York, were all tied to a particular neighborhood back in Kingston, Jamaica. If you were, if you were a shower posse guy, you came from, you know, a certain neighborhood. If you were a gullyman posse guy, you came from the gully, the neighborhood, or, or you know, or Tivoli Gardens, or you know, one of the Kingston slums. And uh, and so those the gangs would form down there, and and that would be their base. And when they set up operations in the U.S. in Miami or New York or another city, they would, you know, they would have that affiliation. And I, yeah, that's pretty interesting yeah. because yes, in Philly, like you might have a, a a gang affiliation because you're on a particular corner in the neighborhood, but the corner in the neighborhood for the Jamaican gangs is back in Jamaica. And that they, served them well because they knew everybody. You couldn't be a member of that gang unless they knew your family back in Kingston. You know, it was you weren't going to fake your way into a gang because. It was all family relationship, friend relationship. You knew who, you know, you knew people who they knew. I mean, it was a very uh, tough thing to penetrate because they all knew each other growing up. And I think right. that, that was one of the reasons it served them well. The other one was I quickly realized that there, you know, just like the U.S., there were two major political parties in Jamaica, the JLP, the Jamaican Labor Party, and the PNP, the People's National Party. And all the gangs were affiliated with one or the other. We noticed a lot more violent activity in the U.S. even around the Jamaican elections down in Jamaica. The, the, the gangs would be shooting it out in New York about the election that was about to take place in, 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 in Jamaica. You know, that was, it was a learning process over a couple of years, but after a while, you know, when I'm sitting in an interview with a Jamaican guy and, and you know, and I start talking about the JLP or the PNP, you could see them immediately change their posture. They immediately knew that, you know, I, I had a knowledge of some of their inner workings. I, I guess also that really says a lot about the political corruption, where the gangs had an affiliation with the political parties. Absolutely. I mean, you had to know who you were dealing with politically in Jamaica, what neighborhood they were from, you know, and each gang had their own and neighborhood had their own way of doing things. Some were more violent than others. And it was just a, a learning process over a number of years. Now, was there a particular gang or a gang affiliation that you were concentrating on and what was your success with that? My first case was the Gullyman Posse case and Eric Vassell was the head of that and that's the one that I uh, talked about earlier where the informant came in, uh, the former Jamaican cop uh, came in and, uh, and gave us all the information. We ultimately arrested him. But, you know, in that, in that case we indicted, th that was the case we indicted 54 people and we uh, we eventually got all of them. Vassal got away, and he escaped on us. The first night, the big takedown, we got about 36 out of the 54. We did uh, 30 simultaneous search warrants in New York, Dallas, Texas, Albany, New York, and other places. But, you know, it was during the, one of those searches that we found numerous photographs of our gang members with the current prime minister of Jamaica. And in those photographs, clearly visible on, on tables in this room were was cocaine and weapons um when you say current you meant current at, at the, the time. time at, the, at right. that time he was the prime minister of jamaica and uh you know the u.s attorney you know it was the time at the you know it was a time period when daniel noriega you know in panama was getting indicted by dea and stuff so you know it, it kind of created a stir that we got these photographs and i was summoned down to the u.s embassy in kingston within weeks of those search warrants and, and word getting out that these pictures were had 
And I remember, you know, being a little intimidated, being pulled into the ambassador's office. They wanted to see the pictures, and so they were looking at the pictures. And, you know, these are State Department guys. They don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. And, and they were looking and trying to see if the do- photographs could have been doctored. But this was before digital photographs. These were not digital right. cameras. You know, these were not doctored photographs. It was interesting to now be embroiled in this political type of thing. They really wanted to know whether we were going to try to pursue the, you know, and, and it was, we were not, it was not that case. We were not going to indict any politicians down in Jamaica or whatever. Only because you didn't have any evidence or right. any... I mean, we had these photographs. Our guys had long moved away from Jamaica. These pictures were from years earlier. Um, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, we were not focused on that. We weren't planning on going that, down that road. We had already had the indictment. You know, it, it, you know, the case had a structure and a kind of a theme already, and this was just kind of a sideshow that came up because we happened to find some of these photographs. But at this point, this is 1990. I've got three or four years in the Bureau at the time. You know, here I am embroiled in this huge indictment, 54 people getting summoned to the ambassador's office of a foreign country. It was, it was, uh, it was quite the learning experience. So now you've indicted uh, 54 people. Yes. How does that affect the gang. I mean, are they still operating? This was pretty Have much a top to bottom um, dismantling. Yeah, dismantling. In fact, we, you know, out of the 54 people, there were two people at passport office in New York that were, were under their control that was giving them U.S. passports um, and stuff. And we had fraud charges in there because they were they were doing some fraud work. I mean, the, the number of charges in the indictment alone was massive. Here I am, three or four years in the bureau, and I'm walking into a room. You know, this auditorium with, I would say we had about 350 to 400 agents and detectives that night ready to take down. I had just come from the courthouse with all the warrants and, you know, my head is spinning. My SAC is basically standing there over my shoulder. You know, it's, it was a lot to, to deal with. And um, But, yeah, it was a top to bottom dismantling of the, of the organization. You know, people told me later that they thought that the, the movie New Jack City was actually based on this case. I don't know that to be sure, but... The, there was a building at the corner of Sterling Place and Schenectady Avenue in Brooklyn. It was a eight-story apartment building, and it ran a block long, and the gang owned it, and we seized it as part of the case. I was working with our forfeiture analysts and analysts at the time long before the takedown, and the night of the takedown, we seized the entire building. I mean, it was a, a, it was a substantial property that the gang owned, and they had, I don't know, there was maybe, there was maybe, 250 apartments in the building um, and occupied occupied and, and, and many innocent people. So when I say we seized it, we didn't evict anybody, um, but we probably had search warrants for 20 of the apartments in there that the gang was controlling. And they had an a elaborate system of traps where they hid the drugs and the, the, the buyer would be brought to one apartment and then the drugs would be brought from another and the money would go to another. You know, so... You know, we it was a it was actually a substantial takedown. The target of that building, the SWAT teams and the NYPD Emergency Services Unit originally had plans to uh, to like uh, fast rope out of helicopters down onto the roof of the building while you know we came up the street and stuff. Those were ultimately scrubbed because literally a, the police commissioner briefed the mayor and the mayor didn't want that scene. He didn't want armed commandos you know repelling out of helicopters and then you know but but it was a major major takedown. I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's it's, that's the type of thing that uh, TV shows and movie scripts are made of, um, and you got to do it in real life. Yeah, and it was it was it was the best learning experience you could you could have. That in the trial that followed, I never learned as much about evidence handling and pro- I I approached my work as an agent so much differently after that. The best thing for any new agent is to go through a trial. Um, because it, it, it changes the way you approach an investigation from the beginning and, and, and how you handle evidence and how you handle l shirt tapes and how you, ha- you know, all of that stuff, unless you get a guilty plea or, you know. The ultimate goal is to have all this stuff put before a jury. Well, there are so right. many pitfalls along the way that can prevent you from getting that before a grand jury initially and then the jury um, that you, it, nobody really schools you on those pitfalls, on the little mistakes you can make along the way that, you know, may lead to, to a suppression hearing or something like that. You know, going through that whole process, especially, you know, we only went to trial on six guys, but it was a RICO CCE indictment. 
So there were many, many charges and, and there were many counts in the indictment and stuff. So, you know, I mean, we had several hundred witnesses. We had, I think, 18 homicides charged in the RICO. Um, so it was a really, a, it was such a great learning experience. I was such a better agent after that case because right. of that experience. And that's great that, as you said, it happened earlier in your career. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was very, very fortunate. So, did you continue after that case to, to work? How long did you work on that uh, Jamaican gang squad? Oh, I worked on that for, uh, from 89 to 2000, so uh, 11 years. Um, my next indictment after that one was the Heartless Posse. Um, we indicted, I think, 32. That case was actually a joined case with FBI Miami, where FBI Miami was doing one of those uh, cocaine for green card cases. Our, our subjects were in, connect, in contact with the Miami subjects giving out green cards. So our, our subjects were all indicted in a case called Island Green out of Miami. Um, I think they indicted 119 people in that case, and it was all that cocaine for green cards. Um, so, but then we did a separate indictment in New York on the RICO, the CCE, the drugs, the murders, and stuff like that. I think we, it was either 30 or 32 in that indictment. That was my second indictment. So, you know, another big case, another, you know, we took them down in the hotel. We took our case down. We coordinated with Andy Bland, who was the case agent in Miami. Um, Andy was a fantastic agent, uh, former West Point guy, and I think he, he was the AD of training, and then he was uh, SAC de uh, Houston. We took our cases down simultaneously, and so we did one of these cases where um, we had a, we had a uh, hotel in Kennedy Airport, uh, the Holiday Inn, and we had two rooms. Uh, we had an adjoining suite where they are undercover. We had a Jamaican agent who we had inserted as an undercover, fantastic agent, fantastic undercover. Um, and he was born and raised in Jamaica, so he knew the, the he knew the, how to, how to get in with these guys. And uh, he was such a good agent, undercover that he was used on uh, by the Italian squads, he was used by the Russian squads, <laughs> he was used everywhere. Hold on, because you were saying that um, one of the reasons the gangs work so well is that they had all these uh, family ties how come this guy was this this undercover agent was able to, to uh, infiltrate the, the gang he was he was from he was from a very small family and it wasn't in kingston it was just outside of kingston and his entire family had already relocated to the u.s i think his his mom one of his folks was deceased the other lived with him and his wife he married a non-jamaican woman so he, I, I don't, I can't remember what his actual cover story to them was, but I think because he had the dialect and he had the language and he, he just like, he was, he was authentic. I was going to say he was acting, but he was so authentic because he was the real deal. I think that they never, ever saw him even as a possible. I mean, they probably thought you couldn't be born in, in Jamaica and become an FBI agent, you know? So I can't remember what his exact cover story was, but he was unbelievable. The bravery of, of participating, because you're saying that they're a very violent gang. Um, oh, yeah. Even yeah. him walking in and sitting down and participating and associating with them, mm -hmm. and he's putting his life on the line. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and after we took that case down, I got approval for him to, as his handler, I got approval for him to stay home. Uh, he basically worked from his home for six months, or, or more than six months, um, doing all our transcripts, or his transcripts from from all the body recordings that he had done and our Title Threes that we had done. Um, we just got approval for him to work from home, you know, come to the office once a week or, you know, bring the transcripts in because now the U.S. Attorney really wanted the transcripts going over with a fine-tooth comb over and over again. And there were changes and, made, you know, markups and things and stuff. So, yeah, so we got him kind of under the radar for a long time until we got everybody rounded up and stuff. And then he did some more on the couple for other squads, like I said, some other, you know, things. But he was they always were real careful with him. And then I think he eventually wound up on a Savannah on an SOG squad or something where he was, you know, out of the limelight and out of the But yeah, we we took that case down in that hotel and these guys were all coming in on the last it was the last of a series of transactions. They had the big load of cocaine and they were ready to get their green cards and so, you know, it was one of those things where we had an adjoining room and the, the undercover would say, Okay okay, here's the cocaine, good, guys, thanks. Let me put this in the other room and go get your cards. And he would go shut the door. We'd have a team in that room come into the subject room. We'd have a team come in from the hallway, and then we took the subjects down. And we did that with I don't know how many subjects. It was basically throughout the day. We started at like 7 in the morning, and we went all the way to like 6 in, at night. 
It was group after group after group, and we had a system. Was it like a, appointments? They thought they had appointments? They, had thought, to they were all having appointments. Now, only about half of them were our gang, and then the other guys were all... Be they were trying to um, swap cocaine for a green card, so I take it it's somebody from immigration that they thought they were dealing with? Yeah, the, uh, we had a, a cooperating witness in Miami, and we had our undercover in New York, who was playing the, the, the role of a guy whose family member worked over at immigration. We were working with immigration, and so we got them provisional cards, because they tested them. They tested the provisional cards, and they actually traveled to Jamaica and back on them. So we had to have these things marked in the immigration system and said, okay, you know, and we said, you know, don't put in there that it's red flag, because then you'll have some inspector going, hey, look, this is part of a big event. You know, we didn't want anybody to kind of raise up on it at all. So there was a lot of machinations about that with immigration, but... You know, immigration agents were working on the on the task force with us, so you know it was a lot of coordination on that kind of stuff. But they all had provisional cards, and then they were coming in to get their quote unquote permanent card when they were ultimately arrested. And this is not something they could have gotten their green card legitimately. Yeah, no, these are all. Well, I think the majority of them had felony convictions and had to come back into the country, so they were illegal reentries to begin with and stuff. So they were not they were not eligible for the cards they were getting. All right, let me ask you one more question about this. Was this something that we orchestrated, or did you find that there was somebody in immigration who was doing this, selling the green cards for, for cocaine, and then you kind of took it over? Wow, that's a good question. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, because that end of the case was in Miami, and Andy Bland and, and the Miami agents actually ran that part of the case. So I actually can't, that's a good question. I've never thought of it, but I, my, my inclination or my memory is that there was another case like the one you described where they had a, a bad agent or a bad administrative person and was doing this. And then the Miami division on their task force with immigration said, hey, why don't we use that and the publicity of that case to kind of set up our own thing. So I think in our case, we didn't, have somebody dirty already in there, but we created it based on the prior case and kind of everybody knew about the prior case. So it was actually good that they said, oh, this can happen. You can get somebody in there to give you green cards and stuff. So, uh, What kind of duties and assignments did you have uh, after that? Well, in 1995, while I was still investigating Jamaicans on, that, on the drug gang squad, um, an opportunity came up uh, in the New York office to be part of the dive team. The dive team was expanding. They had a lot of work. They couldn't handle it with the number of divers they had. And uh, it was the first time they were taking outsiders outside the special operations branch of the New York office. And stuff. so a couple of our criminal guys got me, and we decided to try out. And in 1990... Were you a, were you a diver? Were you a I was a, rec diver? I was a recreational diver. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot more once I got on the team because they do a lot more advanced diving than, than recreational. Um, and And... Quite frankly, my first team leader said he didn't want guys that were too advanced in diving because he would have to get rid of all their bad habits. So I was kind of a, I was all right. I was a recreational diver. I'd gone to the Caribbean a couple of times and dove around in Pennsylvania, you know, kind of. And so I tried out for the team in 95 and made it. And then it became a collateral duty. And so I started working with the dive team like once a month. And then when we had cases, I would travel with the dive team. And What would the dive team do? What kind of cases? Well, would my first real big case on the dive team. So I got on in 95. Well, in 96, we have the Atlanta Olympics. So the dive team is down at Lake Lanier in Atlanta, well, outside of Atlanta, where the rowing events are taking place. And they have these floating spectator stands in the water which, because they float and they hold so many spectators, the substructure goes down in the water 40 feet. Well, every night somebody had to get down there and search to make sure nobody got in in the interim and, and planted a device under the stands. For the, you know. So we were diving with the, with the county uh, sheriff's dive team down there. It's a lot of work, and, and we were doing that. Well, we were there for like two weeks before the Olympics. We were supposed to be there for the Olympics, and the week after, or a couple of days after, so the Olympics just get, always open up on a Friday of the big opening ceremonies in Atlanta. Two days before that, on Wednesday, July 17th, I believe it was, 1996, TWA Flight 800 explodes off the, off the waters of Long Island. A, a 747 JFK bound for Paris with 230 people on it. All souls are lost. Every dive asset in the region is deployed out to uh, eastern Long Island, uh, as we are. My first, my first big case on the dive team is a is a is a 737, 
47 in the ocean with 230 people on it. So a lot of bodies in the water. It was it was quite a scene to be thrown into. That's how a baptism under fire, so to speak, in the in the in the search and recovery world. That seems to be a theme for your <laughs> career. <laughs> baptism <laughs> under fire. Be being in the in the right place in a very serious situation where you learn very very quickly. Yeah, and I mean we were literally deployed out there the first night. I was actually scheduled to go to Atlanta. I never made it. And our, our team split, and the team leader sent half the team in, that was in Atlanta already back up. And then the rest of the team joined us after the Olympics were over. Um, but we were there for four months, diving every day. That so what were you committed. doing? What was the purpose of your, your, your diving? At that time, you know, when it first happened, nobody knew what happened. It could, you know, we were considering it terrorism until we could you know, prove otherwise or until we spent enough time looking at it and had no indication that it was terrorism, right? So Jim Couch from Aradic is working with the NTSB, with Mr. Hall at the NTSB. You know, they're briefing the president every day. They're trying to figure out if this was a diversion and they're going to attack the Olympics, which happens in two days, you know. So it's it was a really high-stress time to have this thing happen two days before the Atlanta Olympics are scheduled to start. You know, and then, of course, you have Centennial Park in Atlanta and you have Richard Rudolph. So, you, you know, there was a lot going on. And we focused on this on, on this just to see we had to rule out terrorism, basically. Um, we had to get as much back as we could. You know, of course, first the first thing was human remains. We had to get the victims back. And so that was the focus of the first couple of weeks and months, getting the victims back. And, and So you were actually diving and searching for body parts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and we did find many. And, and, and day after day after day after day. A lot of kids. What kind of, what of, kind of, what kind of mental toll does that take? I, I just can't imagine. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it takes a toll. I remember the first little girl I recovered on that. It was my first body recovery, and she was 12 years old, and she was from Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I remember it vividly, and I remember uh, there's, like, certain vivid flashes you get. I remember seeing a flight attendant on the bottom, and her blouse was moving, and I thought, you know, that's crazy. My mind is playing tricks on me, and it wasn't until I actually got close to her to recover her that I realized it was because there were there was there was, you know, there was fish life underneath that was feeding. And so all of those memories, they never go away. You know, they always stay with you. And little did I know that I would spend the next uh, really 20 years, the next 19 years recovering a lot of people, a lot of, and unfortunately most of them children. Later on, on the other dive teams that I was on, we did a lot of child recoveries of, 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 of predator victims and things like that. That TWA flight, uh, it just had an abundance of, of of children and teenagers, there was a whole uh, French class from Matamoros, Pennsylvania, that was going over to Paris for this three-week uh, immersion summer program, right, July. So you have three classes of French high school students. You have their teachers. You have their chaperones, which were their parents. And this small town in Pennsylvania lost literally 30 kids. I don't know how many parents and teachers and, and, and stuff. And, you know, you feel that because, the, you know, the parents, you know, there were other people that show up. I remember one year later... On the anniversary of it, they had a, a memorial service out there. They invited all the divers. They had a huge barbecue, and people were walking around with big buttons of their loved ones who they lost, you know, on their clothing, and they would engage you and want to talk to you about the work you did and want to thank you. And I'm so glad I got to do that, but it's it's not something that a lot of agents experience in, in their careers. Oh, no, absolutely not. Initially, you're going down to recover bodies, but your main goal is to recover evidence, I assume. Oh, yeah, and, and after four months, or, you know, the, the, the weather actually into November got too bad, and we started losing too many dive days to, to the weather, and then they had trawlers actually drag the bottom. We had ERT people on those, those, uh, those boats all winter, the winter of 96 into 97. They, and they were rough seas, and those poor guys were getting sick all the time, and they would, they would drag the bottom with nets and stuff after, you know, but... In the end, uh, the engineers told us we got well. We got all 230 victims back. Wow! Um, and we got fantastic. And we got 90 percent of the aircraft back. And the aircraft now has been reconstructed and sits at the NTSB museum in Virginia. And people. And what was the and what was the final uh, outcome of that? The final outcome um, was uh, it was a faulty wiring harness that was run at that time through the uh, center fuel tank of the 747. 
And uh, as odd as it sounds, 230 people is a very uh, light flight for 747 going to Paris. So that was, um, you know, they flew with the center fuel tank empty on those flights to be more economical. And so, you know, as most people know, uh, a a fuel tank full of fumes is more combustible than a fuel tank full of fuel Um, because the, the, the compressed gases in the tank become more of a bomb. And when they went back and looked at other 747s that came off the line in that generation of, of, of aircraft, they saw a pattern of fraying in the in that in the wiring. That plane was delayed on the ground at Kennedy Airport that July evening. They had the air conditioners blowing. They overheated the the, 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 the systems in the plane. And when it got to about 13,000 feet, there was a spark that ignited the center fuel tank. One of the changes the the FAA and the NTSB instituted after that was those planes flew with full fuel tanks all the time, no matter what load was on there. It could be five people on a plane. There was That fuel tank was going to be full. Interesting enough, another kind of side note on that was there was an agent Newark division whose wife was a flight attendant for TWA, and that was her first international flight, and she was lost on that flight. Oh. Yeah. So this, this is really fascinating because I – don't think many people understand that the FBI has a dive team. You, know, you hear about our ERT, which is just the evidence mm-hmm. response team. You hear about HRT, which is the hostage rescue team. But it doesn't sound like, what, what's the official name of the dive team? Well, it's the Underwater Search and Evidence Response Team, or USERT. Um, USERT. And we're actually administratively under ERT. And all the dive teams are co-jointly housed in their field offices with ERT and we go through ERT training and we're we're uh, funded forensically by the lab we get forensic training um, so we're forensic divers we're underwater crime scene experts and I always say like what ERT does above water we do below water it, it's not they do a lot more analysis than we can underwater but um, but yeah we're funded by ERTU and, and they have an SSA at ERTU that covers the dive program and stuff and that started in about 2000, 2001, when I was actually the, the team leader in New York, I had descended to the team leader position at the time. And in New York, we had the only dive team, uh, the only official dive team. Uh, there were some SWAT teams that did some diving and stuff, but um, we had the only officially sanctioned dive team in New York. Well, the lab, we started getting so busy that the lab said, okay, we want to take what you've kind of built in New York and we want to replicate it in three other field offices, Washington Field, Miami and LA. And so I spent the time from 2000 to 2003 not only running the New York team and doing all our missions, um, but traveling to those three other field offices and setting up their teams, buying their equipment, selecting their members, uh, setting up their training courses and things like that. So uh, those three years were were just a blur because of that kind of activity. And then at the end of 2003, we had the other three teams set up 